Hey everybody, Jamie Kelly here. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Season 3 of The Approximate Podcast. Be sure to join our Patreon for only $5 a month to see all of Season 3's episodes in full HD video. That's patreon.com slash approximate podcast. If you're already a patron, thank you so much for your support. And to everyone who's tuned in, we love you all. And now, on with the show. <laughs> Kitty! Fucking stop it! God damn it. Fucking cat. Yeah, you. Oi. <laughs> Stick. Scrapple. Stop it. All right, cut. We're done. Fucking cat. God damn it. Hey, hey, hey. Kaya Eve, how you doing? Fab, how are you? Doing great. I said your name right, right? You said it right. <laughs> this is the first time we're meeting. I know, not on Twitter. Right. I no, always... V-Meet. This is a real meet. Yeah. IRL, not IDL. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, first time I'm meeting you, but you and Steph know each other. Oh, yeah. Briefly. Yeah. <laughs> we met once. Yeah. We got really high together. I'm surprised either one of us remember. Early. <laughs> I tried. I was like, oh, yeah. I fell asleep. You fell asleep. I fell asleep directly after they dabbed me at the bar. I think that's what started like my falling asleep during movies and everything. Because like, as soon as I sat down after they dabbed me, I was just... <laughs> <laughs> we're done yeah i know i drove us home oh no way <laughs> i don't remember that yeah <laughs> i mean there's no other way to drive when it, you've been in vegas right <laughs> yeah there's an accident on every fucking corner you got to be calm and collected and absolutely unfortunately yeah. like weed does that for me i know other people are not lucky but it makes you calm and collected yeah i'm lucky you're one of the lucky ones yeah it keeps me productive so maybe a true stoner would say that but whatever Whatever. Speaking of productive, like, uh, let's introduce the audience to you as well as myself. I know so little. So what's your, where do you come from? What's your experience in the industry? So I started it, as a content creator, mainly like Girl Girl in Denver, Colorado in 2017. And, you know, I felt like I kind of did what I, all I could do in Denver. And, uh, Ariel uh, X uh, evolved wrestling. Oh, yeah. Ariel X from Kink. Kink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ultimate Surrender. All yeah. right. So I was like, you know, I had never filmed a scene before in my life, like a mainstream scene. I had just done content on my a webcam at the time. Um, and I messaged Ariel, and I was just like, hey, if I was ever in Vegas, like, would you ever let me wrestle? She was like, I would always let you wrestle. So I was like, I guess I have to move to Vegas. Like with the <laughs> idea in mind, I'm going to be like a porn wrestler. <laughs> and I moved here and yeah, I did. I went and worked for her and I still work for her to this day. She's an inspo to me and a mentor. Um, so that's where I started. And then... Um, <sighs> Somewhere in there, there was a marriage, and then it like had to end because I needed to start doing boy girl porn for my own mental health. And he was just like, ugh. And I was like, yeah, fuck you. So the ex we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Ugh, he doesn't even, he doesn't have a name. I don't, I don't even know if he's dead or alive, and I you do can't not fucking support care. And hit the bricks. Yeah. So um, I was like, yo, I'm doing it. So I, uh, Moved out in COVID and moved in with a friend during COVID. and To Vegas. Vegas. This all happened in Vegas, yeah. So I, like, wanted to start Boy Girl, but COVID happened. So I fortunately, the, uh, the person I moved in with, like, we got to make content together and get paid for it. So my, my content, my COVID was, like, wasn't that bad. Quarantine wasn't that terrible for me. Um, and then it was time to get out and of you know quarantine and i started actually like you know fucking dudes on camera for money and it was tight and i did it for a couple months um then i got an agent um i'm now agent free uh the agent thing didn't work out for you so well listen -lived, huh? li i was with my old agency for two years oh, over okay. two years there was a uh, we just had some business differences. I think collectively the team was great, but sometimes we just didn't totally see eye to eye and it's better for my business just to right. do me, you know. And I'm also I'm really particular and like I used to not be 
when I was shooting scenes, I was always like, yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. Mm. And, you know, now I'm like, no. Like, I'm good on that one. Thank you. But no. And, you know, agents don't like you saying no. And that's fine. Like, cool. Like, I, I get it. Like, I'll just book myself then. So now, yeah, I just self book and I make content and I've been nominated for a few awards here and there. Kind of irrelevant, but like, cool, I guess. Won a cam award one year. I wouldn't even really consider myself a cam girl, but I guess I cam. So like, maybe I am and people thought I was good at it. So there was that. Who was doling out those awards? Was it a AVN? Was it a That was a Why Not Cam Award that I don't think they're doing award shows anymore and uh it's none of my business but you know ever since the behind the scenes you know (laughs) honestly good i'm glad um that it's ended but nonetheless like cool i guess i got an award Mm. but goodbye um, lastin yeah i get to put it on the shelf hey a free paperweight's a free paperweight yeah yeah. Yeah. honestly yes (laughs) like that is what it serves as correct um yeah, it, you know, in the time that I've, you know, been in the industry, six years, it's exactly six years this month. This is my six-year anniversary. Congratulations for what it's worth. Thank you. Yeah, it's time fucking flies, yo. I thought I was... Yeah, it does. Ugh, seriously, it's like, wow, I've felt like I've I've done nothing, but I've done so much, you know? I'm like, holy shit. But, uh, you know, I started out also being pretty... I thought I was submissive, but... God, that's we could just, just stop it a pretty. joke. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. I pay money for my lips and my hair. So You're saying that you um you thought you were pretty submissive. But... Right, right. Submissive. And um I'm not. I'm a pro dominatrix now. Um that's I, it. I guess part of that goes into why you're well, no longer with an uh an agent anymore. Yeah, it's hard to be like I don't want to do that scene like I'll do this scene, but the dude has to be okay with it. Like me telling him he's a slut and uh, shit like that. Like we could still fuck, but like I'm going to be topping regardless. You know what I mean? And right. it's, you know, I, I but like it, when it comes to like mainstream companies that I actually like working for, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be a little subby here and there, but I'm getting a lot of like girl girl shoots lately and I will always sub for a hot femme any time. A man, no, never. <laughs> but a femme, oh, especially if you're like 35 plus, oh, four, maybe 40 plus. Ayo. 50 plus? Ayo. I'm down. Okay, like I the older the better. But maybe a cut off at like I don't know, 70. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it just seems like agencies thrive off of 22-year-olds with stars in their eyes saying yes to everything and, like, kind of playing off of that. Uh, new face, teenager, yeah, you know, well, school girl, all that stuff. Kids being naive. You know, I'm really lucky when I went win with my agency. So I'm, I'm thirty, going to be 31 this year. So when I got with my agency, I was 25. And I went in and I said, I don't need a dad. I need someone to book me shoots. Right. And that's kind of sometimes where someone at the company, like, it, like he wasn't a dad, you know? He just, like, I get it. Sometimes they think that they have better advice, and that's fine for what you want to do with your business, but sometimes it's not the best for me. And uh, that's just, you know, the way the cookie crumbled there a little bit. Right. I guess this was uh, an agency out of L.A.? Yeah. I guess so, yeah. You don't have to name names. No, so. um no, I used to be with Next Level. Oh, okay. Um, but like like I said, like I I have no issues or anything with them. We actually like collectively had a you know, I had a decent time there. Um, but again, you know, I think an agency, regardless of whatever agency you are with, it is definitely like about what are you gonna make it? Because like it's very easy to let someone Who's, who's supposed to be working for you, make it about them if you're not careful. Absolutely. And I was just very, you know, fortunate to at least be 25 and understand what my boundaries were going into it. And I also didn't have an agent for the first two or three years. And I learned a lot of my boundaries there. So, you know, I, I, I'm really lucky in those regards because I was able to say, no, I don't do anal, and I still do not do anal to this day, and I never have taken a scene, and I never will. And that was a hard sell for my agents. I get it. I don't do anal, and I have a shit ton of tattoos. 
you do the girl math on how that all makes sense in the industry. I don't know. I'm very fortunate that my uh, the directors have given me a chance and my talent show. And, you know, I still I work for browsers every fucking month. So it's great. Hey, well, yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. It's around 25, 26 where you have your you really start to develop your own sense of autonomy. Isn't your brain like also it's, done developing finally? You're right, like right when it starts to like gel and you become the most you you can be and yes. it stops being about like biological development and starts being about uh amassing, you know, experience which informs your future growth. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And I'm very lucky that like uh, I think I got in the industry like yeah, when I was 24. And I'm so fucking lucky. Like, I sometimes like, oh, what would I have done if I was 18? I would have made so much money. Yeah, but I would have been a fucking psychopath. It might have wrecked you. It could. could you know what? It yeah. probably would have wrecked me. So I'm very lucky that I chose to come into this and choose it as a career mainly. You know, it wasn't like a little funsy, like, hee hee, I'm going to make some porn. It was like a, like, fuck, like, I don't want to do social work. Like, this fucking sucks. So does managing a fucking restaurant. Like... This all is garbage. So well, I was going to ask because I find this is some of the most interesting story. And for our listeners and the kind of folks that listen to this podcast, like where that switchover was, what were you dealing with? What were you up to? Oh. And then how did you kind of trip backwards, as it were, into the quote unquote, the industry? Oh, I've got a story. Oh, please, please. My ex-husband at the time, actually. So I was with him. And I had graduated college. Um, I was I had an internship for social work, and it was really sad. And I was also at the same time I had left my managing position at a restaurant that I'd been at for two years because I had moved to downtown in Denver. So I'm I started working at this place called Illegal Pete's. It's um, kind of like Chipotle. Um, but like fresh ingredients from like, you know, Colorado ah. and like really tasty margaritas. So supposed to be, you know, like the fun, the fun Chipotle. I worked with all my friends, you know, like they comp like bands who come through on tour and like they hire you if you, you know, look like me or if you have holes in your face. And I love that. So I was working there. And wait, um, I got to ask real quick. Uh, is this the way I heard it? Is this the kind of place that like had like a venue, like live bands? They just like bands that would come through on tour and they'll comp bands' food. Oh, I see. I oh, see. Yeah, they'll like comp the bands' food that come in. They'll be like, if you like went on their site and told them like, hey, this is my tour, this is my band. They used to like comp uh, bands' food when they would come through huh. like where an illegal pizza was. Interesting. Yeah, I don't really know why that all happened, but cool. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially when I was young and I like, you know, thought I was like, gonna date a band boy and I wanted like pay for his food <laughs> to impress him but I'm like hey have you been to Illegal Pete's <laughs> so I worked there rolling fucking we'll burritos <laughs> yeah I can roll the biggest burrito ever you could give me any size and I could roll a fucking burrito professionally without it being sloppy a hundred percent that's a skill set yeah the first time I did it like my hands I have small hands so the first burrito I was like how the fuck do you do this <laughs> So anyways, I would that's what I was doing, y'all. I was rolling fucking burritos. <laughs> and I was like, I also, this is so much TMI. Oh, this is great. I had my first IUD in, okay, while I was working at Illegal Pete's. And I got a copper IUD, which has no hormones in it. And why the fucking gyno was like, yeah, you've been on birth control, like, you know, since you were 13. Let's put you on the non-hormonal one. Sounds great. So they put the fucking copper devil claw in me. And I had the worst motherfucking cramps for like literally like I had it in for 10 months. So off and on for 10 months. And the last like six months or so, yes, my ex-husband was cheating on me. But also because of this IUD, I was working these 10-hour shifts and I was getting these fucking yeast infections. Mm, son of a bitch. I couldn't leave work. And like my, I know you're like, God, are you seriously talking about your vagina on fire right now? And like, I've never had, I've not had yeast infections since I left my ex-husband, by the way. So, <clears throat> let, <clears throat> <clears throat> so <laughs> I have this IUD. I have this cheating ex-husband. I'm like, what the fuck? How do I, how is this happening all the fucking time? I don't have sex with anyone. I'm in a polyamorous fucking marriage and I don't sleep with anyone. My husband, like he 
cheats on me because he doesn't mm. tell me who he's sleeping with. Like, are you a fucking asshole? Yes. Like, you're so fucking stupid. Anyways, besides the point, back to the IUD. I'm, I can't fucking stand. And I was like, oh, I, I don't know what to do. So I go to the doctor. She was like, hey, so um, your IUD is like accumulating like all this yeast around it and it's not clearing the infection. So like, we just need to take it out. Like, you can't have an IUD. So I struggled for 10 months and I was like, what am I going to do? I can't roll burritos. My vagina's on fire. <laughs> Back at home, my ex fucking husband, who he was an EOD dude in the army, and if you don't know what EOD dude, any listeners, don't. oh, they did bomb detection. So he was the first on the site to like check if there's a bomb, and then if there's a bomb, he's like, hey, bomb team, come dismantle it. But like, you have to have a fucking death wish if that's your fucking job, right? He was the first to die. <laughs> God, I wish <laughs> would have saved me a lot of fucking trouble. Anyways, so he's in the army. He did um. 20 years of service in 12 years. He's a psycho. So never did wow. any like healing past that. It's none of my business. Yeah. Um. So it all matters because he is now, while I'm doing this job 10 months, paying the bills, he's bedridden from having two slip discs in his back, from having like, you know, some fucking injury from like the fucking heavy backpack he carried or whatever the fuck. And I was the only one like working. And yes, he had was getting, you know, his fucking army money. But like, nonetheless, it's like, you're not fucking working. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you literally aren't moving from the couch. I am walking three dogs in downtown Denver and my dog's aggressive. I have to walk him solo. I'm working 10 hours. I was sometimes working till 2 a.m. And then I'd be back, have to be back at the restaurant at 10 in the morning. And then I didn't get home till three. And then you eat. And then it's like, ah, oh, so like that was my life on repeat for honestly like a couple years just in terms of like restaurant to legal pizza and it just got to the point where like unfortunately having a miserable sack of fucking useless garbage on your couch doesn't help but i was like i have to fucking change this so i was like okay i i think i'm finally gonna not be um a model you know like an instagram model and just like go and do hot girl shoots and just like post them on the fucking internet i was like i'm gonna try to make money off this right q 2017 where the podcast began I see. Now here we are. So what was your like first move? It's no longer like a lateral move. It's no longer an idea, but what was the first official thing? Selena Kill. That's who was the the first thing. Hot cam girl from Denver. She shows up on my Instagram feed and I'm like, what is Exotica? What the fuck is this place? What the fuck? And then I click on her links and I'm like, what is mini vids? What is this? Is this homemade porn? I used to love watching cams. That was my favorite type of fucking, like, you know, jerk-off material when I was 13 years old. I loved watching cams.com. Fuck. And I'm like, I could do this? Oh, my God. I don't have to just be a cam girl. Because I didn't, I didn't really like, and I still, as I said, I don't love the cam interaction. And I was like, oh, my God. I can make porno videos and literally sell them for $6? That is sick. So I messaged Selena on my government name you know, personal Instagram, doesn't know <laughs> jack shit. And I was like, hey, um, you're really pretty. I saw you make like these homemade like pornos and like, I want to be in one with you. And she's like, cool, come on over see if you want to like, like, let's chat. And if you like the viable we'll film. So I went over and I had no name. I was just, you know, me, normal, Fresh off the street, normal old me. <laughs> And I, I filmed a sexy ass first girl girl squirting video. Her nice. part her partner filmed it. That was the other thing I really liked. Like I found her because like her content looked beautiful. Like sure. it was very well done. And I was like, shit, like that's so cool. You must have a camera guy and a whole and I'm like, oh, you just have like an apartment and like your boyfriend that's <laughs> whoa. So it really changed my life. Like I always I try to always shout Selena out. We don't stay in like huge touch, but like, yeah, she definitely was like a person that if I had not seen, I don't know where I would be today. Yeah, that's how you got your foot in the door then. Yeah, and I'm, you know, she introduced me to some other, you know, babes out in Denver, which was babes not in Denver. And before you know it, I'm sucking Sophie Ladder's dick. So, you know, like, there we are. Did you start coming up with like your um, uh, pseudonym and personality and stuff like that at that point when, or did that come later? Um, yeah, no, I, I learned pretty quick, quickly from Selena. She kind of like, 
showed me the Twitter world and Instagram. I was like, you really need to get on here and kind of like, you know, separate yourself. But, you know, be warned, all your friends are going to find out. And I was like, I don't really care. Everyone knows I'm a slut anyways. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask about that. Like, what was the social transition? And does your like family and friends, like, how does that all play into it? Complicated, right? I grew up in like, uh, it's like growing up. When I was like 12, I started going to like, you know, hardcore music shows, like, you know, screamy, rah, rah. Um, not like emo, but like angry cavemen. And <laughs> like it's noise like, noise music. Yeah. And, it, and it's like, you know, super misogynistic. You know, you got to fucking fight for your life when you're a fucking oh. whore in a misogynistic culture. So, you know, I, I was always pretty heavily judged, I feel like, by a lot of people because um, I really didn't give a fuck. My my MySpace name, like for instance, was my my government name, but Kaya Tits. That well, that was my name. <laughs> so like since I was fifteen, you know, just going hard <laughs> right away. Just owned it. I'm fifteen. I have great tits. Like who, who the fuck am I? Like are you serious? Where, where is my mother? Oh, I know. Trying to keep me off MySpace and me going behind her back and still <laughs> doing it anyways. That's where she was. My poor mother, bless her soul. I would say you know when I actually like took the leap though. And I and I became, well, I wasn't Kai Eve off the bat. I, I chose the name of one of my enemies as my first porn name, and it, it caused quite a kerfluffle. Mm. And I, I lost quite, uh, I don't, you know, people that I went to the bar with, I wouldn't really consider them friends, but they were like, ah, that is so petty. She could literally get in so much trouble if they were to go on Google and, like, search her name and you were to be there. I'd be like, I'm not Deanna. Like, sh what do you mean she's going to get in trouble? Are you guys like smoking crack? Yeah, you are. Cause I've smoked crack with you before actually. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um, no, I, I definitely like, I said, fuck you to everyone. I was like, if you really don't want to like get behind me in my life, like go fuck yourself. Mm -hmm. You're like, stay in Denver, have a good time going to the same bars for the rest of your life. Fuck you. Um, middle fingers right out the gate. Yeah. All middle fingers. I mean, I really didn't give a fuck because you know what? No one was all that kind to me. And you know what? I'll also say I am five years of recovery of being an alcoholic. And um, because I, I was a fucking psychopath. Like, I was a whole different person. So I get it. I understand, like, you know, drunk me dealing with that. And now I'm being petty about some fucking name. I get it. Some people are just fucking tired of me. And you know what? Maybe I would have been tired of me too. I got fortunately got a fresh start though. And I came here and, you know, I, I don't drink because I, I don't want to be a bad person. You and I that. and I respect anyone who can have a drink, yo. Like, I wish. I fucking wish. But I can't. So I don't. And, you know, I, I'm sure I owe some people apologies out there for some shit I've done in the past. But, you know... I don't know. I was probably drunk and I can't fucking remember. So. Right. Was your decision to quit like um, bolstered by AA or anything like that? Did you go through any programs? You no. Just, you knew when it was enough. And Actually, I was at a burle the burlesque uh, Suicide Girls, the Suicide oh, Girls okay, burlesque okay. show. And I was just, I've, I was at a venue I'd been at my whole fucking life going to shows. And I just, I ordered a tequila sunrise and like I was with a new group of people and I was at a venue where all the like old people I knew were too. And I just like kind of had a moment where I was like, Ugh, this drink tastes like shit. Like it makes me feel like shit. Like I'm a fucking asshole and I am shit when I drink. So like maybe I just won't. And I just remember that being like my last drink and just like really wanting to like not, I really didn't want to fucking convince my friends blackout drunk that I'm okay to drive home and then waking up and being like, how'd I get home? And lo and behold, it was me who drove myself home. And like, that is fucked up. And I, you know, I should be in, you know, fucking jail for doing shit like that. I'm lucky I never killed anyone. And, um, you know, I just have to own that and like know that like if I were to fall back into those habits, like... I'll lose any anything and everything that's important to me. I lose and I fuck up when I drink. You finally have something to lose. Yeah, I do. And, you know, that's the other thing. It's it's funny you say that. Like, you know, quitting drinking goes hand in hand also was like I s royally suffered trigger warning uh, from like suicidal ideation uh, like up until like a couple years ago, you know, and 
I really had to work through that. And some days I'm like, oh, but I'm like, okay, no, the feeling like I'm able to get through it, unlike before, where the alcohol just intensified it. It was just all around bad for me. You know, people can drink and have a wonderful time and just like get loose and ha- like that's. <laughs> God bless you. Like, right, you are right. you are the heroes. But you know, um, folks that don't have to self medicate with alcohol. Yeah, you know, like it's a lot of that. For sure, for sure, and I totally understand that. Like, I'm, I definitely get it. And it's like, you know, there's like, there's just there's so much shit that happens in this world too. And like, that's it. I don't judge anyone. It's just like it has to be what I do for me because I just want to be a good person. And for un, you know, fortunately, like alcohol makes me a bad person. So. I I quit, I gave that up, and, you know, in the process, like, my family was pretty upset when they found out that I, you decided to do the porn route. The the man who groomed me, my my best friend, from when I was 14, he was 22. Oh, goodness. And we stayed friends until I was, like, 20 or 21, because I didn't realize I was being groomed. Wow, yeah. I thought he was my bestie. Right. Um, But... He sent my porn to my parents. Jesus. Oh. Yeah. And he's like a registered sex offender now. Oh, my bet. And isn't supposed to be on the internet. So the fact he found my porn and sent it to my family, my dad sent me an email and was like, you are involved in activities that are not worthy of your dignity or your respect as a woman. And I was like, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> like... Have a really great life. But, you know, before I moved to Vegas, um, we ended up meeting and he was like, I'm sorry for being a fucking dickwad. And I was like, I'm sorry for being a a person, you know, because you need an apology too, dad. So I'm sorry for existing. So we're okay now. You know, it's never, it'll, it'll never be good. It wasn't good since I was young, but like it didn't make it better. And, you know, that's fine. I have really great people in my life and chosen family is wonderful. And I'm very lucky that I at least have an incredibly supportive mother. Not to dig up any wounds, but uh, come from a broken home? A a child of divorce? I've gone through therapy. So your dad and mom are two separate entities that you have to deal with. Since I was two. I don't even remember them being together, actually. And I'm going to say, thank God they were never together. Wow. It, like... My mom was my safe haven. She was where I could go when things got tough. So um, it was a weird growing up. My mom moved to Colorado because she had family there. My dad begrudgingly moved to Colorado because his kids were there. Always something I will respect my father for. Nonetheless, he's still kind of a dick, but you know, so am I. Runs in the family. He 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 has a new wife, and I have my feelings about that. Um, she's been my stepmother since I was like six, but it's hard to call someone a stepmother when they don't act like that. So you know, there's just always gonna be like weirdness from that, and it is what it is. He he has a. I have a little brother who's my half brother. Um, and, you know, I, I I hope he's great, but, like, I don't know much about him, you know? I really don't know much about him. And this um, is a, a kid from your the, stepmom? Stepmom and my dad, yeah. That's always, you know, interesting. Like, my brother, I have an older brother who's five years older than me, and we're besties now. When we were younger, you know, we bicker and fight, but, like... A, a, a child of your dad? Uh, Yeah. Okay. So we're full siblings. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, uh... Really lucky to have him. He's a really great older brother. He's fucking... So, anytime I've ever been in trouble, he's like, how much money do you need for you know, for your ticket this time or your alcohol class this time? Yeah, he's always been a great brother to me. Always had your back. Yeah, al- always has. And, you know, we've always had each other's backs, like, when it came to, like, being at my dad's house and, and shit like that. And, you know, my mom, like... <sighs> She's, like, the nicest person in the whole fucking world. Like, I know people say that about their moms, but, like, like she's an angel. That has been a continuing theme is that the mom, nine times out of ten, is is the good guy, is, yeah. the, is the person that relates and has your back, and it's always the kind of shitty dad. It's, like, almost like, I don't know, I, what's wrong with you straight cis men? 
a question for the fucking decade, yeah. century. For the ages. The ages. Yes. Uh, but yeah, you know, life was like, it was pretty normal to go back and forth, but I knew it wasn't normal. Um, my dad was an airline pilot. So like I would uh, pack a bag and go from my mom's house to my dad's house whenever he was in town. When he'd go on a trip, I'd go back. But my dad like wouldn't buy me anything at his house. So I would have to pack a bag because I didn't have like clothes or like just like shit like that. I had like a toothbrush and pillows, but you know, like I had to pack my stuff. So I'm an excellent packer. If anyone ever needs help packing a fucking bag to go anywhere, I can Tetris that shit like a motherfucker. Preparation is key in this industry. It is. It's honestly. I have go bags. I honestly, I am grateful for the divorce <laughs> and the bag packing because it's gotten me to where I am and I can pack a perfect set bag. It all comes full circle. I was going to ask, um, because I find this is also a common theme. Um, with the kind of guests that we have on is this sense of uh, transition from one place to where the industry is, to where the heat is. Now, you started in uh, Colorado. Mm -hmm. What was the impetus that had you come out to Vegas? Honestly, it was just like I had done all that I could do in Denver, it felt like. like The business plateaued for you. Yeah, I was – and maybe – but also I was like, I will say, you know, six years ago, pre-COVID, as I know y'all remember, it was like really, really hard, hard to find people to film with, especially in like, you don't think of Denver as a remote area now for filming, but six years ago, like I knew everyone that filmed in the state of Colorado. We would go to a brunch and like, it was like 20 of us. And then there was a couple escorts that would come, but that like, that was that was the community, you know? Now I'm checking, I'm, you know, I flip through Twitter all the time and I click on a hot girl's profile and it's like Denver, Colorado. I'm like, girl, where'd you come from? Like, uh. <laughs> so, you know, at the time it just, yeah, it plateaued. I, I, I had made, I had made as many sus sister custom videos as I could with <laughs> my filming partner back there. And I was like, I need a new sister. So um, truly like it was like, uh, I I wanted to do that wrestling with Ariel. And I was like, you know, that is going to be the good, like that's my that's my foot in the door. Right. And it actually was. So it worked out. So you moved out to Vegas. I moved out to Vegas. And how long have you been in Vegas? Since 20, March of 2019. How has the uh, industry like shifted for you or what do you notice as different? Oh, has it is it a good move for you? Absolutely. I you know, I thought I didn't like Vegas when I got here, but it was because I was miserable with my ex. Right. Um that's the thing. You wait for you? Yeah. Well, I th I think that's a thing like for people that are listening to the podcast and that like travel from your humble beginnings to a place of industry, you think things are going to like change right away or that could be a thought that you have in your head and you realize that you you bring yourself with you, yeah, you know? yeah. So you still, like, not that much changes. You still have to deal with, like, baggage and trauma yeah. and things. People think that it's, like, going to change everything. But, you know, it didn't. And we actually weren't married when we moved to Vegas. We got married, like, three weeks after we moved to Vegas because I was attacked by a dog, my dog, and um, almost murdered. And I needed health insurance. That was my third week here. Uh I was attacked by my dog. He was older and... Um, what, what kind of dog? Short-haired German pointer mixed with an American Staffy Terrier. So he's an 80-pound pit bull. Oh, my goodness. Um, I found him on the streets. He's fucking crazy. I, I had to muzzle him when I'd walk him. You know, he's a wild boy. But he loved his mom. I do not blame him for what happened. Um, you know, he was around that abusive relationship that I was in. And... Uh, I was home alone in Vegas because my ex was picking up uh, my car to drive back to Vegas from Denver. And my dog was outside and uh, my ex has two other dogs. So there's three big fucking dogs. And I'm like trying to wrangle all fucking three. And my dog, I look over and he's fucking eating his own shit, which I'd never seen him do before. And I was like, what is going on? Something is happening. What is wrong with you? So I went to grab like doggy toothpaste and... um. 
I went to like grab his 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 muzzle to start brushing his teeth, and I I. He, did it a little too quick. I guess so. Yeah. He thought that I was going to do something, I guess. And I, so he jumped at me and he bit my top of this lip and this whole part of my lip Son was missing. Oh my God. And then he knocked this tooth straight <gasps> out. He hit my jaw so fucking hard. Now no, I have permanent TMJ oh, from man. this. Um, and my tooth just like. Oh my God. And I was like, I like looked down the ground and I was like, what the fuck? just happened and it registered and i could hear the other pit bull that my ex had jerry who's good and was like trying to keep my other dog away from me so i started to like try to like run out the back door and he ran towards me and jumped on my back and tried to bite my neck and missed because i turned around and then he jumped up again and he grabbed my arm and that's like where i have like all these scars from so i held him on my little arm and I just brought him to the back sliding door and threw his fucking muzzle out and slammed the door and he finally let go of my arm. Jesus. Wow. So then, yeah, I I was like, he didn't mean to. He's good, I swear. So they like, put dogs in quarantine for 14 days when this happens and then they have to like pass like a test and if they don't pass the test, then it's no doggy go time. It's, you know, bye-bye. Right. And he did pass. So he was sent home with me. And I was like, we can get a trainer. We can make it better. I know it. And, like, it was, like, a month and, like, almost, you know, another a very almost aggressive thing happened. And I was like, yep, that's stupid of me when you have to put him down. So. So you're, you're more of a twice bitten, once shy yeah. kind of person. You know? Be, like, that whole thing is just, like, I was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to fucking work again. Like, my what, you can't fucking make porn with no lip. Like, are you kidding me? That's a very niche audience. I went to a plastic surgeon. This motherfucker uh, regrew my lip with stem cell powder. We didn't wow. do a surgery. Huh. He fucking ordered some pig fetus stem cells, and I put it on my lip for like three weeks, and my lip grew back. Wow. I would have never known. I, there's like, I think I have two or three rounds of Juvederm just to even it out. Like, I didn't go crazy. Um, but yeah, wow. uh, so now I work again and I'm fine and everything's great. So, you know, whatever. Son of a bitch. Learning experiences, right? We all have life experiences that we call them life changing moments. Or the you know? sum of our experiences for sure. You know, yeah. <laughs> Jesus, what a harrowing story. He was good, okay. <laughs> it's like, it wasn't his fault. I have so many good memories with him. Like, you know, it's fine. Like, yeah. he he rode until the day he died, so, you know. I, I'm assuming you had to put him down. I've put down many of my pets because I've had many pets. Like, I've I've had, like, three dogs, four dogs, and I've put them all down with them, like, in their old age when it's been oh, time okay. to go. Oh, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, I've never been like, let's go euthanize some dogs. <laughs> no, they've all been ready to, like, they're on their way out. Yeah, right. I had a Shiba Inu, and she was just, like, she was... She was a tortured soul. I adopted her. You know, I don't know where the fuck she came from, but I feel like she was put on a leash and like left outside for like her life. And then I found her and she acted like a feral fox and like never really got over it. And so it was time when she was just, it was time to put her down. She's old as fuck. Uh, I had the uh, vet come to my house because she hated leaving the house. And uh, we went out, I went outside went to her favorite little spot and we did the whole thing. And then the vet like walked her to the car and I was walking with her and I saw a white butterfly fly right in front of me across and my mom saw it. And I was like, did you see that? That was so fucking weird, a white butterfly. So I look it up and the symbol is in Japanese culture where Shiba Inus are from, a uh, white butterfly is a symbol of your your loved one passing on and making it to the place that they're destined to be at. And it's them telling you that they've made it there. You got the universe is okay. I can be there for someone if they need to put down an animal because, like, you know, you gotta. Like, it's like you, you're you their whole life, you know? It's it's a duty. Yeah, it's quality of a life thing. If they don't have quality of a life, right. they can't do it A hundred percent, yeah. And I don't... Right, I don't believe in like human life saving measures no. to like save animals. Like if cancer, I'm like, I'm sorry, we have to put you down. Like, why would I treat like that's what people do? That's weird. Yeah, like, you're, you know, it's you're just, really going far into debt for that too because you know nothing's covering that. 
Dude, yeah. I know. That was the other thing too, right? Just like the debt that acquires with all that. I'm like, Ugh. but yeah. Now I just have a cat and she's good. She's very easy, very low maintenance and that's it. She just meows. Needs her wet in the morning and at night. Screams, actually, if she doesn't get it. Yeah, she's good. Do you have a, a lot of time left with her? How, how old's your cat? Oh, she just she's turning 10 on October 31st. So you got about anywhere from three to six years left. She's sprightly. She's got another 10. Trust me. Like, people think she's four or five. Um, she has a belly, though, you know. She has a little, what is it called, a primordial pouch. Uh-huh, yep. yeah. She, she's, she's, she's got a, a thick one. Fat pouches. Yeah, yeah yep. she does. She's good. She's actually my... Saving up that food. Yeah, she's my, um, <laughs> she's my boyfriend's cat. So um, I met a really awesome dude who's been my boyfriend for two and a half years now, and he's a good boy. He's collared by me. He's my 24-7 living sub who i still make breakfast sandwiches because that's my love language (laughs) yeah he got salem when uh his ex-girlfriend actually got salem when she was like two weeks and he was like no get rid of her i already have a cat i don't i have the best cat get rid of her and she jumped on his shoulder one night and that was it they (laughs) fell in love and now that's been his cat for 10 years and she like She doesn't like really that many people. So the fact that she treats me like just like she treats him, it's uh, like the most special thing I think that's ever happened to me. (laughs) Ever. That's so sweet. It's so great when you're like one of the cat's favorite persons. Like the only. Feel love. I know. I'm like, (laughs) I am your mother. Well, he's her mother. I'm like the father because she thinks that I, you know, that he birthed her. I swear. Yeah, you're one of the favorite people though. So you get the lap sets. You get the head scratches. You get all that. Because I'm the one who feeds her the wet. You know, her wet. That's what I call it. Wet. (laughs) Oh yeah. Before we started the show, we had some time to talk. Uh, when my cat showed up, uh, you immediately called them chickens. Where does that come from? Why are you calling cats chickens? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the little quips. Yeah. I'm like, does that not sound like a little chicken in the morning? <laughs> like my cat in the morning. That's what she, when, when she sees me in the morning at 7.30 a.m. because I'm going pee, it's time to let me know that she's awake and she's ready for breakfast. And she walks up the stairs. And I'm like, oh, you're such a chicken. Sounds like a little chicken. Mrs. C. Hicken is her name. <laughs> That's that fantastic. Is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm. Uh, I hate to do this. Uh, it time is flying by, but I'm gonna take a hard left turn. Okay. Because it's getting to be that time. Um, you've been so gracious with sharing all your stories with us. Um, I'm going to bring it back on industry track. Yeah. And I, I'm going to ask you a question. Mm-hmm. Three pieces of advice. And we still have about 10 minutes. Okay. Take your time. Three pieces of advice that you'd give to up and comers in this industry. They could be practical. They could be based on like like totally subjective experiences yeah could be based on drama you know yeah there's no rules we want to hear it from like your subjective perspective well the number one thing that i like to tell people is um just remember that it feels like a competition because other people other directors make it feel like a competition but in like the reality of it like it's not because like You know, the bigger scenes, like, they're mainly usually written for one person, and then usually that person cancels, and then they find a replacement, and then they find a replacement, and then they find a replacement, and finally it's done. But, you know, it's very easy to take this job personally when your whole job is focused on your looks and your talents of what your body can do. And, you know, that's, like, that's hard for people. That's, like, a really hard thing to accept is, like, you're literally getting judged on your body. And it's one of the few industries where it matters. Don't let it get to you because no matter what, like we are here and people are looking at us, but like that's what's important is like you have to just be happy with who you are and yourself. And like when you get down on those days where you're feeling super, super self-conscious, like we all have those days, but remember like, you know, you're still the baddest. Like it's, you know, it's tough, but like, my, my, you know, my advice from that is just like, be easy on yourself and remember that it's not personal. Right. Maybe, maybe not tie up your sense of like personal validation with 
like the ins and outs of what the industry requires of you. Yeah, it's really not that important and it's a little vain. Learn how to compartmentalize a little bit. Yeah, and and like remember like who like, you know, like I'm Kaya Eve, yeah. But you know, it's nice to just kind of like not be Kaya Eve sometimes and it's important I think to kind of like remember that it's hard to be on 24 seven. So, you know, just like honor yourself and make sure that you're giving yourself break and, you know, enough time for mental health healing and whatnot. Yeah. You're you first. You're not your brand. Absolutely. That's for other people. Yeah. And, you know, that also plays into this next piece of advice of like, um, be you, but like, uh, remember that like Twitter, it's still like, unfortunately, like the, the the your professional page is your professional page. And I've learned that by tweeting kind of, you know, some things that probably weren't professional four or five years ago. And I have learned that directors were like, oh, yeah, no, I, I saw that. Or, you know, someone said something like da, 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 da. And then they've met me and been like, oh, like, you're great. You're great on set. I'm like, I know I'm a firecracker. So I'm sorry. I come off a little strong online. So I've learned to kind of like, you know, still be me, but like, pull myself back and like if I need to go shit post just go to your fucking like where your where your BFFFC your shit tweets <laughs> like you don't need to tell and also I'm like you don't need to tell all of your fans that like uh you know the drama that's happening or yeah just uh you know let off steam with your therapist or your yes. closest friends yeah. in I private I highly recommend therapy it's very beneficial pineapple support's been great for me right now and I'm very fortunate that the therapist that uh, I have when my sessions run out through pineapple, she does take my insurance. So that's something to always, you know, mm-hmm. shout Keep out to mind. anyone listening, yeah. you know, talk to your uh, therapist, see if they she takes your insurance. But um, I guess that's two pieces of advice. My last piece of advice. Maybe something practical. We already spoke about how you're a really good packer and that like really plays into like success, getting prepped for a scene, being able to pack a bag. Oh. Are, are you the kind of person that like, uh, like I overpack and I bring stuff that normally wouldn't be brought to a set because I anticipate that, uh, not to sound like an asshole, but sometimes I, on the call sheet, yeah. I realize I'm working with somebody that's new and that they're going to forget their brush. They're going to forget their hair dryer. And yeah. I bring all that shit hear you. to lend. You know, um, but same though, I do that too if I'm not like flying somewhere. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, practical advice is honestly, like, I guess some content advice is like, I have um, an actual, like, in my notes app on my iPhone, just like everything that I need to do to make sure that, like, I get what I need out of the scene that I'm going to release for myself. Like, uh, you know, I have the list of, like, pictures, not safe for work pictures. Do we want sex stills? Usually no, but if they want them, okay. You know, TikTok, safe for work reel, and then going into your content, making sure you kind of have like a flow and then um, paperwork, making sure you have all sides of ideas. Like I have it all written down because like I've been doing this six years, but I've still forgotten sometimes it have been like, you know, oh, fuck, I forgot to take a photo of the back of your ID. Like, I oh, forgot we have to do that now. Yeah, that's a um, new thing. That's fucked me. <laughs> but like, that's some really good advice I would give is like stay, taking all of that and then being organized with it. Because I, once I decided I wanted to get my own website, kayaeve.com, shout out, um, I realized I had no organization whatsoever. I didn't have a PDF with, you know, descriptions, title. I had nothing. It's just all on a, my mini vids. It's all where it was. I didn't actually have a, a fucking set copy in front of me. So I've transcribed it all and now I keep it pretty decently organized. And that to me would be like a really like just start. Even if you're three years is deep, start now because it's going to be worse in three years. Yeah, make a list of contingencies of what the scene requires on any given day. Yeah. And make a list, make a physical list, make a checkmark list. And I have, I printed out the checklists from kink.com. There's like the consent checklist. They're they're valuable. And I just keep a copy so that I can go through that with people if they don't know. You know, sometimes performers are new and they're like, oh, I'm good with anything. And like, that's been me before, but now... You know, having that piece of paper, I'm like, okay, are you good with sounding? And like the dude's like, what's that? And I'm like, okay, so you're not good with everything. Got it. Okay, perfect. Right. So, be be yeah. ahead of the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I would recommend. I get it. It kind of comes with time and experience. But hey, I've got the time and experience. So take the advice. 
get from, get real familiar with Google Sheets. Yes, seriously. <laughs> That is all amazing advice, and we're coming up to the last few minutes of uh, recordable media, so I got to say thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It has been an absolute treat. Yeah, I'm happy you DM me back. (laughs) 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 I'm excited to have you through. You film content, right? I'm just kidding. We already talked about it. (laughs) 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 He, he, he. Thank you so much. And for everybody that's watching, everybody that's listening, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Approximate Podcast. And everybody wave at their cameras and say goodbye. We love you so much. And we'll see you next time on another episode of the Approximate Podcast. Bye. Bye. Bye.